Section 12 of Astounding Stories 12, December 1930, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Grey Denim by Harl Vincent. Part 1. Beneath the huge central arch in Cooper Square, a meeting was in progress, a gathering of the grey-clad workers of the lower levels of New York. Less than two hundred of their number were in evidence, and these huddled in dejected groups around the pedestal from which a fiery-tongued orator was addressing them. Lounging negligently at the edge of the small crowd were a dozen of the red police. "'I tell you, comrades,' the speaker was shouting, the time has come when we must revolt. We must battle to the death with the wearers of the purple. Why work our lives down here, so they can live in the lap of luxury over our heads? Why labor day after day at the oxygen generators to give them the fresh air they breathe?" The speaker paused uncertainly as a chorus of raucous laughter came to his ears. He glared belligerently at a group of newcomers who stood aloof from his own gathering. Seven or eight of them there were and they wore the gray with obvious discomfort. Slummers. Well, they'd hear something they could carry back with them when they returned to their homes. Why, he continued in rising tones, do we sit at the controls of the pneumatic tubes which carry thousands of our fellows to tasks equally irksome, while they of the purple ride their air yachts to the pleasure cities of the sky lanes? Never in the history of mankind have the poor been poorer and the rich richer. Yeah shouted a disrespectful voice from among the newcomers. "'You're full of bunk. Nothing but bunk.' An ominous murmur swelled from the crowd, and the red police roused from their lethargy. The mounting scream of a siren echoed in the vaulted recesses above, and re-echoed from the surrounding columns, the call for reserves. All was confusion in the square. The little group of newcomers immediately became the center of a melee of dangerous proportions. Some of the more timid of the wearers of the gray struggled to get out of the crowd and away. Others, not in sympathy with the speaker, rushed to the support of the besieged visitors. The police were, for the moment, overwhelmed. The orator, mad with resentment and injured pride, hurled himself into the group. A knife flashed in his hand, rose and fell. A scream of agony shrilled piercingly above the din of the fighting. Then came the reserves, and the wielder of the knife turned to escape. He broke away from the milling combatants, and made speedily for the shadows that lay beyond the great pillars of the square. But he never reached them, for one of the red guards raised his riot pistol and fired. There was a dull plop, and a rubbery something struck the fleeing man and wrapped powerful tentacles around his body, binding him hand and foot in their swift embrace. He fell crashing to the pavement. A lieutenant of the Red Police was shouting his orders, and the din in the square was deafening. With their numbers greatly augmented, the guards were now in control of the situation, and their maces struck left and right. Groans and curses came from the gray-clad workers, who now fought desperately to escape. Then, with startling suddenness, the artificial sunlight of the cavernous square was gone, leaving the battle to continue in utter darkness. Cooper Square, in the year 2108, was the one gathering place in New York City where the wearers of the gray denim were permitted to assemble and discuss their grievances publicly. Deep in the maze of lower-level ways, seldom visited by wearers of the purple, the grotto-like enclosure bore the name of a philanthropist of the late nineteenth century, and still carried a musty air of certain of the traditions of that period. In Astor Way, on the lowest level of all, there was a tiny bookshop, nestled between two of the great columns that provided foundation support for the eighty levels above. It was safely hidden from the gaze of curious passers-by in the square. Slumming parties from afar, their purple temporarily discarded for the gray, occasionally passed within a stone's throw of the little shop, never suspecting the existence of such a retreat amidst the dark shadows of the pillars. But to the initiated few amongst the wearers of the gray, and to certain of the red police, it was well known. Rudolph Crassen, proprietor of the establishment, was a bent and withered ancient. His jacket of gray denim hung loosely from his spare frame, and his hollow cough bespoke a deep-seated ailment. Looking out from behind thick lenses, set in his square-rimmed spectacles, the watery eyes seemed vacant. 
uncomprehending, but old Rudolph was a scholar, keen-witted, and a gentleman besides. To his many friends of the grey-clad multitude he was an anomaly. They could not understand his devotion to his well-thumbed volumes, but they listened to his words of wisdom, and more frequently than they could afford, parted with precious labour tickets, in exchange for reading matter that was usually of the lighter variety. When the fighting started in the square, Rudolph was watching and listening from a point of vantage in the shadows near his shop. This fellow, Leontardo, who was the speaker, was an agitator of the worst sort. His arguments always were calculated to arouse the passions of his hearers, to inflame them against the wearers of the purple. He had nothing constructive to offer. Always he spoke of destruction, war, bloodshed. Rudolph marveled at the patience of the Red Police. Today these newcomers, obviously a slumming party of youngsters bent on whatever mischief they could find, were interfering with the speaker. The old man chuckled at the first interruption, but at signs of real trouble he scurried into the shadows and vanished in the blackness of first-level passages known only to himself. He knew where to find the automatic substation of the power syndicate. Returning to the darkness he had created in the square, he was relieved to find that the sounds of the fighting had subsided. Apparently most of the wearers of the gray had escaped. He skirted the avenue of pillars along Astor Way, feeling his way from one to another as he progressed toward his little shop. Peering into the blackness of the square, he saw the feeble beams of several flash-lamps in the hands of the police. They were searching for survivors of the fracas, maces and riot pistols held ready for use. A sobbing gasp from close by set his pulses throbbing. He crept stealthily in the direction from which the sound had come. "'Steady now,' came a whispered voice. "'My uncle's shop is close by. He'll take you in. Here, let me lift you.' There was a shuffling on the opposite side of the pillar at which Rudolph had halted, another grunt of pain. "'Carl!' hissed the old man. It was his nephew. "'Uncle Rudolph?' came the guarded response. "'Yes. Can I help you? Quick, yes, he's fainted.' The old man was around the huge base of the column in an instant. He groped in the darkness, and his hands encountered human bodies. "'Who is it?' he breathed. "'One of the hecklers, uncle. A young lad. And of the purple, I think. He's been knifed.' Together they dragged the inert form into the shelter of the long line of pillars. There was a trampling of many men in the square. That would be a second detachment of reserves. A ray of light filtered through and dancing shadows of the giant columns made grotesque outlines against the walls of the way. A portable searchlight had been brought to the scene. They must hurry. Impeded by the dead weight of their burden, they made sorry progress and several times found it necessary to halt in the shadow of a pillar while the red police passed by in their search of the square. It was with a sigh of relief that Rudolph opened the door of his shop, and with still greater satisfaction closed and bolted it securely. His nephew shouldered the limp form of the unconscious youth and carried it to his own bed in one of the rear rooms. "'Ugh!' exclaimed old Rudolph, as he ripped open the young man's shirt. "'It's a nasty cut. Warm water, Carl.' The gaping wound was washed and bound tightly. Rudolph's experienced fingers told him the knife had not reached a vital spot. The youth would recover. "'But Carl,' he objected, "'he wears the purple, under the gray. See?' It'll get us in trouble if we keep him." He was stripping the young man of his clothing to prepare him for bed. Suddenly there was revealed on the white skin a triangular mark. Bright scarlet it was, and just over the right hip. He made a hasty attempt to hide it from the watching eyes of Carl. "'Uncle!' snapped his nephew. "'The mark you call cursed. He has it, too.' The tall young man in grey was on his knees, tearing the hands of the old man away. He saw the mark clearly now. There was no further use of attempting to conceal it. Rudolph rose and faced his angered nephew, his watery eyes inscrutable. "'You told me, Rudolph, that it was a brand that cursed me. I have seen it on him, too. You have lied to me.' The old man's eyes wavered. He trembled violently. "'Why did you lie?' demanded Carl. "'Am I not your nephew? Am I not really cursed as you've maintained? Tell me. Tell me.' He had the old man by the shoulders, shaking him cruelly. "'Carl, Carl,' begged the helpless ancient. "'It was for your good. I swear it. You were born to the purple. 
That's what that mark means. Not that you're degraded to the gray, as I said. But there's a reason. Let me explain. Bah! A reason. You've kept me in this misery and squalor for a reason. Who's my father? He flung Rudolph to the floor, where the old man crouched in apprehensive misery. Please, Carl, don't. I can explain. Just give me time. It's a long story. Time. Time. For twenty-odd years you've lied to me, cheated me. My birthright. Where is it? He menaced his supposed uncle, was about to strike him. Then suddenly he was ashamed. He turned on his heel. I'm leaving, he said shortly. Carl, my boy, begged Rudolph Crassen, struggling to his feet. You can't. That lad in there, he— But Carl was too angry to reason. To hell with him, he raged, and to hell with you. I'm through. He stamped from the room and out into the eerie shadows of the way. Carl was done with his old life. He'd go to the upper levels and claim his rights. Some day, too, he'd punish the man who'd stolen them away. God, born to the purple, to think he'd missed it all, probably was kidnapped by the old rascal he had been calling uncle. But he'd find out. Rudolph didn't have to explain. Fingerprint records would clear his name, establish his rightful station in life. He dived into a passage that would lead him to one of the express lifts. He'd soon be overhead. A sergeant of the Red Police looked up startled from his desk as a tall youth in the gray denim of forty levels below appeared before him. "'Well?' he growled. The stalwart young worker had stared belligerently and insolently, he thought. "'I want to check my fingerprint record, sergeant. Hm. Pretty cocky, aren't you? The records for such as you are down below where you belong. Not mine, I think. So? And who the devil are you?' That's what I'm here to find out. I've got a triangle branded on my right hip. A what? Triangle. Here, look. The amazing youngster had raised his jacket and was pulling at his shirt. The sergeant stared at what was revealed, his eyes bulging as he looked. Lord, he gasped, a Van Dorn, in the gray. Quickly he turned to the radio vision and made rapid connection with several persons in turn important ones by the appearance of the features of each in the brilliant disk of the instrument. Carl was confused by the sudden turn of things. The sergeant talked so rapidly he could not catch the sense of his words. And that name, Van Dorn, eluded him. He knew he had heard it before in the little shop down there in Astor Way, but he could not place it. He wished fervently that he had paid more attention to the desires of old Rudolph, had studied more and read the books the old man had begged him to read. His new surroundings confused him, too, and he knew that he was the center of some great new excitement. Then they were in the room, two individuals, one in the red uniform of a captain of police, the other a pompous whiskered man in purple. Others followed, and it seemed to Carl that the room was filled with them, strangers all, and they stared at him and chattered incessantly. He experienced an overwhelming impulse to run, but mastered it and faced them boldly. A square of plate glass was placed under his outstretched fingers. It was smeared with something sticky, and he watched the whiskered man as he held it up to the light and studied the impressions. Then there was more confusion. Everyone talked at once, and the pompous one in purple made use of the radiovision holding the square of glass near its disk for observation by the person he had called. The identification number was repeated aloud, a string of figures and letters that were a meaningless jumble to Carl. The room became quiet, while the police captain thumbed the pages of a huge book he had taken from among many similar ones that filled a rack behind the desk. Carl's blood froze in his veins at the rumbling swish of a car speeding through the pneumatic tube beneath their feet. His nerves were on edge. Then the captain of police looked up from the book, and there was a peculiar glint in his eyes as he spoke. Peter Van Dorn, missing since 2085, wanted by Continental Government. Ha! The words came to Carl's ears through a growing sensation of unreality. It seemed that the speaker was miles away and that his voice and features were those of a radiovision likeness. Wanted by the great power across the Atlantic. It was unthinkable. Why, he had been but an infant in 2085. What possible crime could he have committed? But the red police captain was speaking again, this time in a chill voice, and the room of the police thick with the smoke of a dozen cigars, became suddenly stifling. "'Where have you been these twenty-three years, Peter Van Dorn?' asked the captain. "'Who have you lived with, I mean?' Something warned him to protect old Rudolph. 
and somehow he wished he had not treated the old fellow as he did when he left. His self-possession returned. A wave of hot resentment swept over him. "'That's my affair,' he said defiantly. The captain shrugged his shoulders. "'Oh, well,' he said, "'you needn't answer. Now. We'll find out when it's necessary. In the meanwhile we'll have to turn you over to the Continental Ambassador.' Two of the Red Police advanced toward him, and the rest drew back. "'You mean I'm under arrest?' asked Carl incredulously. "'Certainly. Of course you're not to be harmed.' One of the guards had him by the arm, and he saw the glint of handcuffs. They couldn't do this. If it had been for rioting in the square it would be different. But this! It meant he was a prisoner of a foreign government, for what reason he could not guess. He lost his head completely.' The captain cried out in amazement as one of his huskiest guards went sprawling under a well-planted punch. This youngster must be as crazy as was his father before him. But he was a whirlwind. Before he could be stopped he had tackled the other guard, and with a mighty heave flung him halfway across the room where he fell with a thud that left him dazed and gasping. The pompous little man in the purple crawled under the desk as the sergeant leveled a slender tube at the young giant in gray. Carl ducked instinctively at the sight of the weapon, but the spiteful crackle of its mechanism was too quick for him. A faintly luminous ray struck him full in the breast and stopped him in his tracks. A thrill of intense cold chased up his spine, and a thunderbolt crashed in his brain. The captain caught his stiffened body as he fell. Carl, refusing to think of himself as Peter Van Dorn, came to his senses as from a troubled sleep. His head ached miserably, and he turned it slowly to view his surroundings. Then, in a flash, he remembered. The paralyzing ray of the red police. They never used it in the lower levels, but overhead, why the swine, he sat suddenly erect and glared into a pair of green eyes that regarded him curiously. A quick glance showed him that he was in a small padded compartment, like that of the pneumatic tube cars. At one end, there was an amazing array of machinery with glittering levers and hand wheels, a control board on which numberless tiny lights blinked and flickered in rapid succession. At these controls squatted the twisted figure of a dwarf. A second of the creatures sat at his side and stared with those horrible green eyes. Lord, he muttered, am I still asleep? No, smiled the dwarf. You're awake, Peter Van Dorn. The misshapen creature did not seem unfriendly. Then where am I, and who are you? You're in one of the Tsar's rocket cars, speeding toward Dorn. We are but two of the Tsar's servants, moon men. Rocket car? Moon men? Carl was aghast. He wanted to pinch himself, but a hollow roar to the rear told him he was in a rapidly moving vessel of some sort. Certainly, too, these dwarfs were not figments of his imagination. You've been kept completely ignorant? asked the dwarf. "'It seems so,' Carl was bewildered. "'You mean we are out in the open, traveling in space, to the moon, perhaps?' The dwarf laughed. "'No, I wish we were,' he replied. "'But we are about halfway to the capital of the Continental Empire, greatest of world powers. We'll be there in an hour.' "'But I don't understand.' "'Stupid. Didn't you ever hear of the rocket ships that cross the ocean like a projectile, mounting a thousand miles from the surface and making the trip in two hours?" No! Carl was aghast. Are we really in such a contraption? he faltered. Say, are you kidding me? The dwarf was incredulous. Do you mean to tell me you know so little of your world as that? Have you never read anything? The news broadcasts? The thought exchangers? Don't you follow them at all?" Carl shook his head in growing wonder. Truly Rudolph had kept him in ignorance, or was it his own fault? He had refused to dig into the volumes old Crasson had begged him to read. The broadcasts and the thought machines—well, only those of the purple had access to those. End of Part 1